we're here at the American Heart Association 2023 scientific sessions. This morning we had a fantastic presentation by Dr. Carson from UMD, UMD Ru and Rutgers. No, Rutgers. Robert, Rutgers, Wood, Robert Wood Johnson Medical School. Medical School. We are part of Rutgers now. Part of Rutgers. Very, very For happy about, to like, have you. For about eight years. <laughs> Dr. Carson, <laughs> it's great to have you. You just presented the MIN trial, which is uh, a very, very important question that we clinicians have. Do we liberally transfuse patients or do we are we restrictive? And you know, if you ask 10 cardiologists, you have a patient with an acute myocardial infarction whose hemoglobin is eight, what do you do? You will get 10 answers. 10 different answers. Yes. And I think today you showed us with, uh, with support and sponsorship from the NHLBI, is that correct? That's correct. Uh, you conducted a robust study uh, large numbers of patients. Your original mint was 110 patients. This was north of 3,000. 3,500 3, plus. 3,500 patients. And um, you showed us some really interesting and intriguing results. You didn't meet your, um, your endpoint. You just missed it by two events, as you told us. That's right. Um, so that's got to be tough to, to even think about. But what are the implications? I mean, I think it's a really important one. And I'll, and I'll preface this with the fact that, so you're talking to somebody who um, has been looking at bleeding for a decade and, and thinking about the association of bleeds and transfusions with mortality. And we've shown this over and over again. When a patient bleeds with an acute coronary syndrome and we transfuse them a couple of units of blood for the bleed, or transfuse them because they just, we, for a, an anemia that we don't know, the, the drop blood drops, we don't know where the cause is, and we're, we see a very, very important association with mortality. Today, you showed us otherwise. What does this mean? So let's begin first with that observation, because it's a very important observation. All the, and, and, and observation's a good way of starting it, because these are observational studies that you just described. No, they're that, randomized studies, but an observation from randomized right. studies. Right, but m much of the, and, and, and some of the data that was presented by the discussant today is observational studies in which you look to see who got blood and who didn't, and then you show consistently in the literature that anyone who gets blood does worse than people who don't get blood. And that's not just in acute MI, it's in ICU settings, it's in every transfusion setting. And, and essentially what that is, is what we refer to as confounding by indication. That is, when you're looking at observational data, trying to assess whether transfusion is good or not, it, it, when, even though you try to do lots of adjustments, statistical adjusting, you're never successful. And consistently in all the work that's been done in the field, any observational studies show that anyone who's getting blood versus those who are not, they, they have higher mortality, they have adverse outcomes. But the clinical trial data is very different. So the clinical trial data, we've been doing meta-analysis now for many years, published in Cochrane. Our last one was published a year or so ago. 21,000 patients enrolled in these trials and uh, comparing liberal versus restrictive, kind of like today's study, which we'll talk about in a minute. And, and the relative risk there is 0 0.99, very tight confidence intervals. So consistently showing in trial data that, that you're not harming patients, but that you're not improving their outcome either. And if you're not improving their outcome, you're not gonna use more blood. You might as well use less blood, mm -hmm. avoid those but, rare side effects. But your trial failed to show that you, you improve outcomes. No, well, our trials you know, you, you suggest- You didn't meet the statistical Well, I, I, I would argue with you on that one. Um, in fact, oh, we but will- I like it, that's why, <laughs> that's why, that's why this, you're asking because me. Because we need, the, the audience is listening. Right. And it's a very wide audience, and we need to be cautious about telling people, go ahead and liberally transfuse everyone. Right. And I think what I asked you on, on the panel was, who are those people who would benefit most? Because yeah. it's not everyone. So we don't really know at this stage of the game. I mean, w w that's one of our primary aims for our secondary papers. You know, no doubt, and almost in every kind of intervention that you do, that, that there'll be patients that will be benefited by your intervention and others that won't. Mm -hmm. We are gonna figure that out. 
and 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 I don't have the answer for you today. So you're gonna have you're gonna have to wait I'm for that. I'm gonna have one. to wait for that because I think that's really important. I totally, and, I 100% agree you, with when you. When you have a, a neutral, but um, trend, I'm gonna call it a trend because yeah, okay. it's not significant. All right, so and let's it, let's debate this point. P, because a P of 0.06, and or even a 0.05. I mean, to me, you have to be. A, the P is just, let's just be, it's a, it's a dirty word, honestly. It's a dirty letter in, 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 in clinical trials because it's really hypothetical, right? Right. And so the probability of being wrong is, you know, 6% as opposed to 90, you know, 94% right. confidence that it's okay. Right. So what does that mean? Does that, should, what that does change, really mean? should that change what you do? That, that's right. But in every trial, if we go back and if we took every single trial, that had a 0.06 or a 0.1 or a point, you know, whatever, somewhere around there, and implemented those um, uh, treatments, I think we'd be in a different place. So we have to have a place where we start to say, okay, where do we look at this with cautionary tale? And you know what? To me, this is, it, it gives me a good feeling that I'm not harming my patients who I'm transfusing. I think your study showed that. Right. Um, and, and I think that's really important. And, and when push comes to shove, and you've got an elderly woman who is you know, gasping her breath and her hemoglobin is seven, I'm gonna transfuse her after a myocardial infarction. So please don't think that I'm not. I'm, no, I, I'm not interpreting yeah, your yeah. comments that way. I, but I'm let, thinking let, about them positively. Right. But let's talk about the, the, you know, how we should interpret these results, right. and, which is really the point you're bringing up. So our, our primary outcome, which is based on the imputed relative risk, which accounts for the 57 patients in whom we didn't have the primary, is that the lower confidence interval is 0.99, right? And the p-value is 0.07, actually. So you gave me a little benefit of calling it 0.06. Yeah. And um, so how do you interpret that? Well, we would argue that it's, it's actually a nuanced interpretation and that you should not base it on a p-value but rather look at the relative risk and the confidence intervals and use that to... But the to, confidence intervals cross one. It does. So what right. is the, So what is our confidence interval says? And so our lower confidence interval says, 0.99, that there's a small chance that if you give a unit of blood in this setting, you are not benefiting that patient, right? That's what it says. But most of the evidence here, with the point estimate of 1.15, right? So a 15% relative odds of improvement, up to a confidence interval of 1.34, so a 34% relative increase in benefit. The weight of that evidence would suggest that you're more likely to help that patient, and the chance that you're gonna harm that patient is not evident in this, in this, in this trial because we saw no suggestion remotely that using a lower threshold would be preferable. So you're dealing with either a small chance of no difference or a much more likely mm -hmm. chance of finding benefit. And then a key point, a key point is, well, okay, but what's the what's the potential that I'm gonna harm that patient by giving a unit mm -hmm. of blood? I think in the end, so in Mint, we saw very little added risk with a but liberal isn't transfusion. But is it fair to say that a lot of your patients had the, that funny threshold of eight and nine, most of them were in eight and nine hemoglobin, right? Well, that's where they started. That's right. where their baseline That's, that's right. where their baseline So they're track. kind of like almost near normal. They're not like severely anemic. Like they're not six or seven. They're like eight and nine. Well, and but eight so, and nine is not normal. Eight and they're, nine. They're near, they're, they're not. Well, they're, they're, not, not, they're not 12, which they're is not 12. or 13. Right. They're not right. 12 or 13, that's which right. is normal. That's right. And, um, you know, most MI patients, only 20% of MI patients are anemic. You know, with hemoglobin less than And the average 10. unit of bloods was? In the liberal group, a third of the patients got one unit, a third of the patients got two units, and a third of the patients got three plus units in, in, in mint. So is it, so on units. average, the, the, number of, the average number of units was 1.8 units per patient, mm -hmm. if, you, if you just average it all up. Mm -hmm. So I think the weight of the evidence points to is suggestive. It do, it's not definitive. I totally agree with you. It's not okay. definitive. No, but it's definitely suggestive. It's, no it's highly suggestive. And all our secondary outcomes aligned in the same way, including, including all-cause mortality. Um, and, and then the absolute difference is really the other point that I made t today. 2.4% absolute 
difference between recurrent MI and all-cause mortality in, in the liberal group, or a 1.6% difference in mortality. I mean, those are clinically important numbers, and they're comparable to a lot of tr interventions that you will do in a cardiology Well, system. I will say that I'm certainly going to be a little bit more liberal, okay. not as liberal as you would like me no, to be. No, I don't, maybe. I'm not trying to push you. To, <laughs> I, but I, I will be more liberal, but I'm not, I've not been restricted because I do believe that, you know, your clinical judgment as a physician, as you're looking, and, and it really has to do with everything else that's going on with the patient. The patient that's bleeding is a very different issue than a patient who's just anemic, you know. So uh, I, I totally I, agree with you. I think that's an important, important, uh, you know, distinction that we have to make in this. So let, let, me, let me make two points to yeah. follow up that. The first is, I think if, if this trial leads to cardiologists and other clinicians not to allow patients to go to seven or maybe even eight, then it's contributed, I think. That's the first thing. So mm -hmm. avoiding those lows based on this evidence seems rational, number one. Well, then we'll have to get more people to donate blood, right? Because that was my issue. Well, before we'll come, to, we'll come back thing. to that in a second. Let me just... The, the, um, the, the, I lost my train of thought. I'm sorry. Sorry, you had two points. Yeah, and I'm trying to remember the second one. Um, the, um, come back to it. So. Well, talk about the, 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 the masses of blood that so, we're going to need. The, so no doubt that this will lead to more transfusion. So how much more transfusion? If you were to restrict using liberal in patients with acute MI, so in the U.S., there are 10 million units transfused a year, mm -hmm. 100 million worldwide, okay? There's about 800,000 or so acute MIs in the U.S., okay? And if 20% of them are anemic, so if we do the math, I think that's 160,000 patients, and, and they're gonna, let's just yeah, say they're gonna, gonna get two, two units. units, so it's gonna be about 300,000 300, units in the setting of 10 million units, it's not a huge impact. But clearly, there will be times that it might be. Mm -hmm. there, if there are blood shortages, there could, it could be. Mm -hmm. We're talking about the U.S. That may not be the yeah, case in right. other places. And you mentioned that. It, may, you know, it could be in other countries where that could be a huge problem. And, and we went through supply issues that I mentioned also. You know, during COVID, there was supply issues. Um, but we don't, you know, I don't know what your hospital, but we don't usually see much in the way of, of when we, when we well, need a unit of blood, we're usually, there's not usually a problem well, getting Well, I'm gonna it. say, Dr. Carson, congratulations. You answered a question that's really, really important. Often not, you know, who's gonna fund a study like this? And thanks to the NHLBI to really be listening and understanding that these questions need to be answered. And you did a fantastic job in enrolling patients and giving us an answer. And I think we have some idea of what to do next, and we can be more liberal in transfusion. Okay. How's that? Uh, I, think, I, th I, think, I think I think that's perfectly fine. Is that okay? I think you should do <laughs> what right. you're comfortable with. That's right. And, and but use I, your clinical judgment and yeah. make sure that you are. So that was that was actually the, the point I wanted to make to you. Versus yeah, that was actually the point I. So if we published guidelines in JAMA in October 12th. Uh, sponsored by the ABB, which is a yeah. transfusion group. And we have in that guideline what we call a good practice statement. And that good practice statement says exactly what you said. Amazing. Your <laughs> it, it, said, it said that use a number that puts you in the ballpark. You need to think about that's one of the pieces of evidence that you want to use to decide whether to transfuse or not. But don't just base everything on, on a number. Base it on the clinical symptoms based upon the clinical settings, based on how, uh, how a patient, whether they want to take blood or not. Some patients are not, are not going to want blood. And what do their vital signs look like? And, what's, and, and how are they doing clinically? Those all should be part of the, that, that get factored into deciding whether they get blood and not well, just the hemoglobin level. So I totally agree with you. Well, thank you so much. I'm so thrilled that you made time for this and that now our audience around the world will be hearing about this and hopefully taking away really important pearls from this conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thanks, uh, thanks for, having for bringing me. your science to the American Heart Association. And thanks for the American Heart allowing me to do this. Thank Appreciate you. it.